Susan Walsh is the founder of the classification guru, Fixer of Dirty Data. She's a specialist in data classification, supplier normalization, taxonomy development, and data cleansing. She brings clarity and accuracy to data, finding cost savings and driving efficiency through time management. After years of working with data, Susan has developed a methodology to accurately and efficiently classify, cleanse, and check data for errors, which help prevent costly mistakes from happening because of inaccurate recording. Susan is passionate about highlighting awareness and the value around addressing issues of dirty data and its consequences through her YouTube channel, LinkedIn webinars, and speaking engagements. Today, Susan will be speaking about the dangers of dirty data and its consequences. Susan will share with you the importance of data accuracy and examples of how this affects the end user. She will cover examples in supplier normalization and data classification within analytics and automation. And she will show you how to make quick spot checks of your data to find problems and ensure data accuracy for your data moving forward. Welcome, Susan. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, so, yeah. I'm here to talk to you about the dangers of dirty data and its consequences, and I'm sure most of you watching will have encountered uh, some of these at some point. So quickly, I will just let you know uh, a little bit about myself, talk about what I uh, would define as dirty data, the importance of data quality, the consequences of dirty data, how you can ensure data accuracy, how to spot check your data, and then we'll summarize everything at the end. So hopefully this will be of interest to you. So what about me? Who the hell is the classification guru? Where have I come from? Why am I talking to you right now? Well, I've had quite a long and varied career. Um, I started off in blue chip companies working within sales, account management, national account management. Um, before deciding that it wasn't for me, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I thought, why not open a shop? You know. That's what you do, isn't it? So I ran my own business for a short time, but the costs were very, very high. Um, it was very stressful. I learned a lot, but at the end, I had absolutely no money left. I was desperate for a job. So I saw an ad online and went to work for a spend analytics company. And I spent five happy years with them. I learned so much about data classification. I ran and managed a large team and managed other projects. And while I was there, I noticed that, you know, a lot of these companies are spending a lot of money on some expensive software and dashboards. But actually, the real issue is the raw data that comes in. And it was shocking every single time. Uh, I can guarantee you I've never seen a, a, an, even an okay data set come in from a client. It's always been a bit of a mess. And I'm sure that you can relate to that as well. So that's why I started the Classification Guru. I, I knew I was an expert in my area, uh, specifically within spend management and spend data classification, uh, working with taxonomies, supplier normalization. So a lot of my examples will be around that today. However, you will be able to um, apply those to your own uh, real life scenarios that you might have as well. And at the end, if you've got any questions, I might be able to, to be able to help you with those. So what is dirty data? It could be misspelled words, it could be incorrect descriptions, it could be missing codes, it could be data in the wrong columns. And if you've worked with a database, you'll know quite often the zip code is in the wrong column, the town, the county is in the wrong place, half the address is in one column and half of it's in the other, or the whole address is in just one column. So it can be really frustrating. You might not have any standard units of measure. So how are you defining grams within your data? I've seen it various different ways from a G to GM to GMS to grams to G R A M -M -E M E S. There are many different ways to spell the same thing. It's the same with liters, probably centimeters, meters, all those kind of measurements. So it's really good if you can standardize that process and agree within your, your organization what terms you're going to use. Um, it then reduces your duplicates um, and any kind of errors like that. Currency issues, I'm sure we've all had those where we've got multiple currencies in, in the same columns and we don't really know where it's come from and where it's going. 
and formatting as well. I mean, I don't know about you, but I struggle sometimes with dates. You just can't get them to, to be formatted correctly. They're all over the place. Some people use uh, slashes, some people use dots, um, it, and it really causes problems throughout the data file. And finally, of course, our favorite duplicates. And it's not just duplicates, but it's near duplicates. So particularly with um, examples in databases, you know, you've got Andrew Smith or Andy Smith but it's the same person. So they're, they're not quite duplicates um, and that can cause a lot of problem. And as you know, it can take a lot of time to fix. So here's some examples that I'm gonna share with you from real life classification um, where the data has been really dirty. Uh, so this example, my first is probably one of my favorites because I think it's one, the one that I just could not understand why the person got this so wrong. The supplier is LinkedIn, the description is restaurant, and it was classified as a restaurant. So it's a clear classic example here of not looking at the supplier name and the description in context. So clearly they've used LinkedIn maybe to advertise a restaurant or recruit for a restaurant job. But actually, we all know that LinkedIn is a software platform, so it should be either advertising or software fees or subscription fees. Another one, uh, another common uh, company that comes up quite a lot is Thomson Reuters. So they tend to be publishers. They also do events. Um, but quite often I see people think that they are legal services because they publish a lot of Legal, docu uh, legal books and things like that. So in this instance, it should actually be classified as an event because they've been running a conference. And then this one, sometimes the wording can be really close to what it should be, but it's not quite the same. So thermal installations here was classified as thermal insulation, but actually they're construction maintenance services. So you have to be really careful. One of my favorites, uh, joke technology, when I Googled this, uh, nothing to do with jokes whatsoever. They are a manufacturing company. So, you know, don't always just take uh, for granted what, what the name of the company is. It's not always what it appears to be. And this final example is my favorite, Tinder Corporation. So this is not the Tinder that we all know. This is Tinder in the UK and they are an IT services company. So it's really, really important when you're working with data, not only to, to look at one area of it, but look at it all. So for example, if you look at the supplier name in this instance, and then the description, the description tells you or guides you to, to, to know that something's not right here. So we better check this out. So that's how I came to discover the Tinder Corporation, not the other Tinder. So it's easy for me to show you examples uh, as they were single rows, but when you look at data as, as it is now, just, just our rows and rows, it's, it can be really hard to, to uh, spot that, that incorrect data. It might not stand out as obviously as I just showed you. So there are a number of things we can do to kind of work around this and make it easier. So we can manage this in a number of ways. Um, when you're classifying data, and again, this can be applied to other aspects of data, look at the vendor name and the description. Don't, you know, or, you know, the GL code or the, the department, it will give you a guide as to, to what it should be. Um, when it's new data, you've never seen it before, then, you know, just Google it. It's, it just makes sense. Um, sometimes you get some surprises in there. And don't assume that the, the description is correct. So some of those examples I showed you, um, for example, LinkedIn, maybe restaurant wasn't the right uh, description. Maybe it had been typed in wrongly. So, you know, you need to use a bit of experience, knowledge and context um, to, to when you're doing this. And values can be a really good guide if it's something financial. So for example, with hotels, if the value is say $50,000, that's probably gonna be a venue hire for an event, if we can remember those before they were all online. Whereas if it's maybe $500, $1,000, it might just be accommodation. So there are lots of different clues and guides within the data that you can use. But it's not just about data classification. Um, it's also about, normalization as well. So 
This is Granger. So if you're working with global data in particular, there might be different companies within the in the world that have the same name and Granger is a really good example. So here in the UK, Granger PLC is a home builder, whereas Granger Industrial Supplies in the States is very different. It's nuts, bolts, uh, lots of maintenance products. So you have to be really careful and not just uh, bulk uh, normalize things or, you know, if you're using fuzzy matching, then you know you really need to check it and make sure that, that it's, it's correct. And again, when you are looking at this with the rest of the data, you will have guides in there, like the descriptions, which will make you think, okay, that doesn't look quite right. Why do I have um, construction materials or con landlord services and MRO supplies in the same supplier? That doesn't look quite right. So use it as a guide. And how can we manage this a little bit better within our organizations? Well, normalization should be like a, a wider master data thing as well. So don't assume that you know what the company is or what it does. You know, think about would the company use this product service um, or, or buy it or sell it? You know, where is the supplier located? Do a Google check again, just make sure. Um, sometimes you'll get uh, information at the end of the company name, whether it's Inc, Limited, LTD, PLC, SPZOO, these are all indicators of, of the origin of the company. And does the website match the description of the goods purchased? So again, with Granger, if you went and had a look at MRO, but you were in the UK, you would see actually they don't sell that. That's, that's something different. So, you know, why is this important? Well, First of all, you save time fixing dirty data. And, and uh, I'm sure that about 99% of you have spent time fixing dirty data. You know how frustrating it is, especially if you're halfway through a project and you need to go back to the start and fix it all. It can be really costly to rectify. If you've installed some really expensive software and then you get to near the end of the project and then you realize that the data that was imported was... Uh, not correct, it was missing information, and you might even have to go back to the start of the process and do it again. It's, it can be very expensive. It's going to affect your decision-making processes as well. So the data that you have will guide your business decisions, and it can impact all areas of the business, from sales to marketing, procurement, Production forecasting and an example would be um, sales decides to run a promotion. That's going to impact marketing because maybe marketing don't have budget to support that promotion. Uh, procurement might need to um, buy in more raw materials to make the product that is being promoted. So it has a knock on effect. So it's really important that the information you have is right. And let's face it, it makes your life more difficult and nobody wants that. So what are the consequences of all this? As you can tell, in most cases, not great. So within reporting and decision-making in particular, I mean, generally within businesses now, it's some form of dashboard that is used to make decisions on business. Um, things like cost savings, Supplier negotiations, supplier rationalization, forecasting, budgets. So an example I like to use um, is I had a client who had IBM classified as cleaning services. So while you think, how did that happen? It, like I said before, you know, when you have a long list of data, it can get lost, especially if it's a low value. So this is from a procurement perspective. And if that cleaning services was left within IBM to, to say there, if there's any kind of automation within the, the business or rules, that cleaning could then get refreshed each quarter. So that say 20, 10K becomes 20K, becomes 30K. And then suddenly it becomes a problem because you think you're spending a lot more on cleaning services than you actually are. That affects decisions within the organization. You know, do we need to cut back on cleaning? Do we need to negotiate with our suppliers? Actually, 
what you're finding is you're actually 30k short on your IT equipment. So you're, you're focusing your energies in the wrong areas. And an example um, of dirty data within normalization. This is a list here. Now you might not be able to see the, the names along the side here, but we've got things like Doubletree, Doubletree by Hilton. We've got IBM, IBM Limited, PwC, PwC LLC, and the value goes up to 75,000. But when we correctly normalize this, we can see actually there's only four suppliers out of all those list of suppliers that are there. And the value goes up to 190K. So you might think that you're only spending 70K with PWC, but actually once it's normalized, it's 190K. That's a significant amount more with one supplier than your organization probably realizes. Same with IBM and hotels. So you can see that it makes a real difference and, and could really impact decision making um, you know, there could be, it could flag up things like rogue spending as well. So there's a lot, you know, and it doesn't have to be spent, you know, you, this could be applied to any kind of data and any kind of category. So before I was telling you about the IBM example where it's been misclassified. So this is how it would look um, at level one, level two and level three. So at level one, we've got facilities and IT spend. At level two, we've then got cleaning, hardware, peripherals, and then we've got further detail into level three. Now, when this is correctly classified, you can see that actually the IT spend has gone from 18K up to 27.5K, 28K. So again, you know, it's telling a very different picture to your organization. Now, that doesn't need to be spend, that could be sales, that could be forecasting, that could be anything. And again, it's changed the spend within the other two levels as well. So it can really have an impact on, on what you are showing to your business. Um, if you, you know, the senior management will be using these kind of dashboards to make business decisions. So it's really important to get that, in, that data correct. So what about technology implementation? I'm sure that you've many of you have been involved in implementations that have not really gone to plan. You'll find that data cleansing is often neglected. It's not even considered at the start of a project. Um, you might find that errors are only discovered mid or post implementation. Staff lose faith in the data. They say it's wrong, it's incorrect. You know, the software doesn't work properly. Um, they're disengaged. They're saying it's not working and they don't trust it. And then it can cost a, a, a large amount of money to fix that problem and also get the trust back within the users that they can actually use that data again. So again, as I said, it costs a lot of money to fix. You've got to hope the staff will adopt the technology but actually there's some cases where projects are abandoned and I've heard stories of companies spending millions on software and, and then it's never been used because the project's been abandoned. So, you know, instead of spending millions up front, invest 10, 20 K on cleansing your data, maybe a little bit more depending on the volume and you would save all that money much further down the line. And it makes sense, but it, it can be a hard sell to senior decision makers. And what are the consequences for machine learning and automation? Well, you have to have the data cleansed and prepped before it goes in. So AI is learning from training sets and then it's making decision based on those training sets. Um, it needs a huge number of, of training sets to learn from and that data has to be accurate because if it learns from bad data, it's gonna automate bad results. And machine learning as well, it's, it's based more on instructive uh, information such as coding and rules. That can be tricky because if you're just using some set rules, it might pick up information that is incorrect. So if you had a basic rule that said, if the description contains the word hotel, classify it as a hotel, you might have a description that is 
taxi from hotel to restaurant. And actually it's the taxi that should be classified, not the hotel. So making sure it's right, making sure your rules are correct, uh, not too broad, not too vague, um, will, will really help with these things. And of course, you know what they say, garbage in, garbage out, and it, it's never a truer word has been said. And I'm sure a lot of you are nodding right now. So how can we ensure data accuracy? Um, it's a bit of a tricky one. There's no quick fix or magic button. There's certainly no software out there that will, you know, you can put the data into and it will magically uh, make it better. Unseen data for the first time really needs to be seen by a person with human eyes. Um, you know, we need to understand context and referencing. Like I said about the taxi from hotel to restaurant, we need a human to look at that before it can be passed on for automation. And get the whole organization involved. So data is, is all of our responsibilities. It's not just Bob in the corner in IT or Pam in accounts, you know, who's dealing with the finance stuff. It, you know, we should all be looking at our data regularly um, and understanding it. And if we do that, then we'll know and be able to spot when there's errors in it much more quickly and, and easily. And we'll be less intimidated by the thought of having to work with data because, you know, we're not all technical uh, people. You know, some of us are, are just regular guys and gals. Um, so we need to make it accessible for everybody um, and, and easy to use. And it's really important to agree your common standards, terms and processes. So like we talked about units of measure, um, you know, it could be um, internal um, wording or acronyms. You know, we need to have a, a clear maybe dictionary of, of what we should be saying and how we should be saying it and stating what it means. And it's really important to maintain your data. So you might fix it and it might be absolutely perfect. It's gonna stay like that for about a minute before new data comes in, something's been changed, something's been edited. It, it never stays perfect for very long. And in fact, I'm not even sure there is such a thing as a perfect data set. But by maintaining it, again, you uh, do it regularly. So it could be monthly, it could be quarterly. Um, I really wouldn't suggest any less frequent than that because you want to um, be familiar with your data, like I said, get to know it and then things will, will jump out when they're not quite right. And you should be doing spot checks regularly as well because even though you know it's correct when you first do it, it's you know, people can come in, people can change things, people can accidentally delete things, people can overwrite things, cut and paste errors happen all the time. So it's really good practice to just actually spot check your data and make sure that it's still as, as accurate as it should be. And then this is something that I've come up with to help you um, ensure that you can have your data accuracy. So I'm telling you that you need to make sure that your data has its coat on. So what is quote? Um, it's consistent, so make sure you're using your standard terms. Um, it's organized, so you know, are you assigning parts of data to different departments, different people? Um, it is like a closet. You know, you might have a favorite top in the back of the closet somewhere, but if it's not organized properly, you don't know where to find it. It's the same with data. The information you need is there. You can help to make it easier to find. Um, it has to be accurate. And basically that means it's got to be correct. You know, if it's not correct, it's not accurate. And finally, it has to be trustworthy and you can't have trustworthy data without the consistency, the organization and the accuracy. You know, you want to know that you can make decisions based on solid, uh, true data. And you want to have the confidence to give that to your senior management as well, you know, so that when they come back to you with questions, you, you, you know that it's, it's good and it's accurate. And like a, a quote, there are different levels of data services out there. So you might buy a cheap coat and it might kind of keep you warm and a little bit dry when it's wet. But actually, you know, if you invest in a, a good um, well-known brand that's specifically for that purpose, that coat's going to last you for years. And it's the same with data services. 
the more you invest in it, the, the more rewards you'll reap from that. So how do we spot check our data? Um, so everyone's using different uh, software and tools right now. I personally use Omniscope, but it's quite a, a niche product. So I wouldn't expect you guys to be able to easily access that. So I have used Excel in my examples, but you should be able to take what I'm showing you here and then transfer that to the software that you're using. So if we look at, first of all, uh, it's just if, again, it's, I'm, I'm talking, as an example with classified data, but you should be able to transfer this to whatever you're working with. It could be codes, um, it could be products, you know, it, it applies to everything. So if you get your data, what you want to do is put it into a pivot table. Now, I'm going to tell you now, Excel is not the easiest to work with, but I have to say, if you want to get everybody involved, it's a really good way of getting uh, people to, to start working with data and um, they don't have to learn any software. It's a nice entry point um, and, and will benefit you. So you want to change the layout of your pivot table once you've got it there. So you want to show it in a tabular form. So you've got your suppliers down the left hand side and then you've got your categories along the right. That means that when you scroll down, you can then start to pick out anything that doesn't look quite right. So in this instance, uh, Breaks um, in the UK is a, a catering food service company. So having them provide transportation and mail and storage services uh, sticks out, that, that's not right. So that's it. great if you've got a small amount of data, but if you've got a large amount, which I'm sure most of you have, um, you will be working, uh, flipping between sheets, which is really annoying. So the first thing I would do is click on a new window. I'd select arrange all, and then I'd arrange them vertically. And then it looks like this. So then you can have your two, uh, sheets side by side. Um, if you've got a very small laptop, then this is probably not going to be great. You might want to just overlap them a little bit. But what that means is on the left, you have your pivot table. You can go down and look and see uh, what's not quite right. You can then search for that in the data tab, go down, change it and correct it. And then you're updating the, the, the data real time. And it just saves time from flicking back from sheets and losing your place and you don't know where you are. And it just makes it easier. Um, so I've gone, covered that. Um, once you have made changes in the data tab, if in the pivot tab, if you click refresh all, then that will update your pivot and then you can go back through it and then start to look for, um, for new incorrect data in there. So it's great because it means, you know, if you've corrected something, you're not going to cover the same ground again. Also, if you have really large sets of data, you might want to just focus in on one single supplier, or maybe you have a team, so you want to split you know, suppliers out by team. Uh, you can do that. I would suggest that you copy the supplier's data into a new tab, do the pivot table that I've just showed you, um, and then do it by supplier and then you'll see the classifications and anything that's not right will stand out. And if you work in uh, manufacturing or pharmaceuticals, then, then this is a really good way to do that. So say you had um, uh, a, uh, a lab equipment company, Thermo Fisher, and you're going down your list and suddenly you see apples in there you're going to know straight away that something doesn't look quite right. And, you know, again, this, this is not necessarily something that a really experienced um, analyst or technical person has to do. This, other people within the business could be trained to do this. Um, if it's, you know, not too um, niche and, and technical in terms of experience. So, that's basically uh, my talk on dirty data for you guys. Um, really can't emphasize enough how accurate data is critical. It's so important. There are no shortcuts. You have to put the work in. You have to know your data. So look at it regularly, familiarize yourself with it, get people involved, 
and then maintain it, you know, regularly, check it, spot check, you know, I've given you the tools, it doesn't have to be hard, it doesn't have to be a long, tricky process. Um, and remember, it makes your life easier. I mean, who doesn't want that? And finally, remember, make sure your data has got its coat on. So it's got to be consistent, it's got to be organized, it's got to be accurate, and it's got to be trustworthy. And if you follow those principles, uh, then you won't go too far wrong. I hope that's been of interest to you. These are my details, so please, please feel free to get in touch. Um, I'd love your comments and feedback, and if you have any queries, I'd be happy to help you. So thanks very much. Excellent, thank you very much, Susan. And uh, in this, certainly a great topic and one that we have uh, talked a bit about before, and you know, kind of like you alluded to, you, you do really have to put the work in because um, there, you know, there are certainly tools out there to make your life easier in regards to data cleansing. None of them are, are a magic bullet, and so it's still something that you do have to spend quite a bit of time and effort on as an organization to really not only clean it, but to to make sure that it stays clean. So. Um, so you know, this is, this is a, an extremely relevant topic and it really doesn't matter what your technology stack is. Um, going to the cloud doesn't, uh, you know, as we've talked about before, it doesn't, uh, doesn't fix your data. You know, if you go in with bad data, you're gonna come out with bad, da bad data and it doesn't matter what infrastructure you're running on or what platform or, or, or really what tools you're running on, this is still a problem that almost all organizations grapple with. So uh, it's super relevant. Uh, thank you very much, Susan. Thank you. We do have a couple of questions here. Great. So, uh, first question is, why did you choose to use Excel for this exercise? So, it's not my favorite tool of choice. Um, I get very frustrated with it. However, if we want to encourage uh, data accuracy, data, better data quality, and get our data right, we, we need to use something that is accessible to everybody. So as I mentioned, I use Omniscope, which is an amazing tool and takes about at least half the time of using Excel, but not everybody's going to have access to that. So by, by using Excel, it makes it accessible to everybody. Um, and as I say, as if you are using other tools, you should be able to apply what I've, I've just shown you um, to whatever you're using. Yeah, and I think that's uh, I think that's a great explanation. Excel is certainly um, one of those tools that more or less everybody has, and uh, you know, and I think everybody has at least a, a basic Excel literal literacy, or at least yeah. uh, uh, at least to the point where they're able to perform pivot tables and you know do some do some basic, basic operations like that. So that that does mean that the barrier to entry is rather low for getting started in uh, in data analysis and data cleansing. So I think that's a that's a great um, uh, you know, I think that's a great point. Uh, so you, you talked, uh, you, know, you, you mentioned OmniScope. What other tools would you suggest for being able to do the same type of um, activity? So similar tools would be things like uh, Click, uh, Click View, Tableau, um, uh, possibly Alteryx, although that might be more data modeling. Um, there's a number of different, oh, BI, of course, as well. Um, there's a number of different visualization tools out there. So, you know, whatever you're using, there will be a method that you'll be able to adapt that to. So the, the, the takeaway really there is the ability to group your data, the ability to sort your data, the ability to do some basic math operations like counts, perhaps uh, mins yeah. and maxes and things like that, right? To be able to um, accurately get your hands on. And of course, there's a huge number of tools that uh, that are able to do that, uh, you know, at all sorts of different price points. So I, I uh, think most organizations will probably find that Excel is not the only option that they have for being Absolutely. able to do this. They probably have a handful of different options, hopefully, depending on you know what organization it is and and uh, in what tools a, a given person has, has access to, right? But a word of caution again, just the, there are visualization tools, um, where you get tools that might help you clean up data. That's a slightly different different tool. So I would still say, work on your data first before putting them into those kind of tools. Um, you, you want the data to be as clean as possible. Um, don't expect magic software to be able to fix everything for you. 
yeah, I think that's a great message. Um, next question that we have is how do you manage data right back? So after you have gone through the exercise, you've identified the problems, you've hopefully fixed some of them, how do you get the data back into the system of record? Okay, so not a massively technical person. Um, so something that I might do is if I have pulled the data out um, into an Excel file, um, you can assign a row ID to it. So that's, that would be an easy way to match back on a row ID. Or what you might want to do is not touch your master data in the center. You might find that there are different departments within an organization that uh, use different terminologies. So a way around this would be let each department work with their data, which you can then map back to a centralized um, master data source. Um, and then that would mean that everybody gets to speak in their own language within their own department, but the master data um, remains uh, uh, untouched. Yeah, and, and I think that's, sense? sorry, go ahead. Does that make sense? No, it does. Uh, and I think that's, uh, I, I think that's fair because there are, you know, certainly depending on the uh, the complexity of the of the uh, deployment at your organization, depending on how many uh, how many systems you have, how many functional areas those cross, whether or not you have an MDM system specifically for master data. I think this you know it becomes a very uh, a, a very long and complicated answer depending on how you have deployed your your master data tools and technology, um, and so uh, you know it's it's certainly a bigger conversation than I think that we can have right now, but uh, it's, uh, you know, certainly, certainly super important to, uh, to, to understand how to, how to get the data mapped back to your source systems. Um, so that's excellent. So we have time for one more question and then, uh, and then what we'll do is we'll hop over to our, our, our Q and A room where we can uh, go, go in there and we can talk, uh, you know, in some more detail about some of these yeah. subjects. Last question that we can get to right now is what can organizations do to ensure better data quality going forward? So there's a number of things. Um, it's really important. Um, I've talked about consistency and, and using standard units of measure and, and dictionaries. And this all relates back to data governance, data stewardship. So um, it, it's really important to get something in place so that the whole organization is, is, is singing from the same song sheet, as they say. Um, and and that will, that will um, define and set out how you label things, what are your processes, how you work. Um, and it, and it, you know, it might be a, a bit of a culture change and a mindset change at, uh, at the beginning for some people, but in the long run, it will, it will make um, managing your data a lot easier uh, and you'll have less errors, less duplicates less almost duplicates. Yeah, so, and I think that's, um, that, that's a great rundown. The, you know, I think the, 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 really the overarching message here, right, is that we need to make sure that, uh, that everybody who is entering data, right, at various entry points across all of the different uh, functional areas in the organization, they are following some standards, some rules for yeah. how data is going to get in, that they're checking for duplicates, that they are checking for consistency and making sure that, you know, if we're, if we're looking for a particular field in a, uh, a customer catalog or something like that, that we actually have a process for figuring out what that is and populating that data at the point of entry so we don't then have to find the data quality these back end and then fix them later right um and so again it's, it's again it's a it's a broad conversation that's around um around data governance and around data stewardship and all of the different pieces that kind of uh, need to fall into place it's really it's, important. yeah it's very very important you know and and i think uh you know just like this like we mentioned before this is one of those things that it is it's completely technology agnostic. It doesn't matter what tools you're using, what platforms you're using, what databases, what BI tools, what ERP systems. Um, none of these are going to solve this problem for you. And it's, you know, it's something that you really need to do with, with process and, and governance and make sure that you have, um, you know, that you do have, 
you know, you know, stakeholders in the organization that are uh, that are ultimately responsible for all of these uh, the data quality in all of their areas, and uh, you know, and make sure that they um, they actually have a way to uh, you know to to ultimately enforce those rules, right? So yeah. I think that's really what it comes down to. Yeah, and actually something that um, is probably not specific to data classification, but um, happens a lot is um, within within classification, there's quite often more than one right answer. So it's it's not about um, which one is, is better. Um, it's about choosing one and being consistent with that answer. So... Um, you know, you could have hotel and some people might put it under travel, but some people might put it under hotel, whereas actually you want everyone to put it under hotel um, so that you get a true picture of what's going on. And, and I'm sure it's the same within other areas of data as well. You might have more than one right answer, but by having those standard processes and, and terms and procedures, it makes it a lot easier to manage. Yeah, it, it absolutely does, and then I think in, in the example that you uh, you know that you mentioned, there are um, a number of instances where I have seen exactly what you mentioned, and what that ultimately uh, ends up relating to is a different a different level of the GL hierarchy. And so this is going to determine if is a traveler or is it a hotel. This is going to determine which category it rolls up to, and uh, and ultimately your ability to report on the data at a granular level. So it's it's more than just not being able to um, uh, accurately find out what's a hotel. It's going to be in a more broader problem where you're going to look at a travel category and say, I would like to break out my travel expenses. You might not actually be able to do that if you have too many yeah. things that are just rolled up into that parent level. Uh, you might not be able to get those breakouts that you're looking for to say, okay, how much am I spending on fuel, hotel, Starbucks, you know, uh, yeah. uh, you know, dinners and all of those things, right? So um, th th that becomes a much um, that becomes a much uh, bigger problem if you're not placing things in the correct level of the hierarchy. Nothing, nothing really works right, right? If you yeah. if you kind of do it that way, so so that's great. Uh, so we we are out of time for this section. Uh, we can join Susan over in Q and A where uh, okay. everybody can hop on camera and have uh, you know have a little bit of a, a little bit more of an in depth discussion with Susan uh, Susan about some of her topics and um, you know and uh, and have more opportunities to ask questions. So see everybody over there. Thank you, Susan. Bye.